All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's virtual plant clinic. Um, if you have attended these uh, clinics in the past, welcome back. If you are new, we're so glad that you can join us. Um, just a couple of quick notes today. David is going to be covering uh, some warm season vegetable topics and some cool season vegetable topics since we're kind of in that period where people are starting to transition. So he's going to handle uh, warm season and then we'll take some questions for that and then some the cool season and then we'll take questions for that. So just be prepared for planning to handle questions in that way. Um, if uh, you are not able to stay for the full call, or if you have any questions that don't get answered, then you can hit reply to your Zoom confirmation email, um, send me a note, and I can send you a copy of the recording, uh, and I can get David to answer any questions for you following up after the class. So we are recording today, so this will remain accessible. Um, for those of you who have questions during the class, You'll hit that Q&A button on your Zoom menu. You can type the questions in there and I'll be monitoring those for David while he's doing his presentation for you guys. I think, I think that about covers it. Uh, please do let me know if you have any questions during the class, techni technical issues or otherwise, uh, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And uh, David, I'm gonna go ahead and let you get started so we can get to the subject at hand. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, Sally. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, and I wanna talk about vegetables. I was telling somebody each time when I do one of these classes, I'm like, oh, what do I wanna talk about? And uh, a lot of times it's just based on what's going on in my world, or it might be based on questions that I'm fielding on the emails, or it might be questions I'm seeing at the clinic. So basically I, I feel like uh, it's a little bit of a weird time to be talking about vegetables here we are in the middle of summer but i look at this as like one of these transitional times i think these are really important seasons in our garden uh, it's a time where we kind of start thinking about what we might want to plant for fall um, and so i thought this would be a good topic to present today uh, so so like i said i'm just checking my notes here a lot of, and I want to emphasize this, I'm going to say this two or three times throughout the program, a lot of what I'm talking about today, a lot of the actual plants, we do not have in stock. Um, so if you get like all motivated or, you know, think, hey, that makes sense. I want to go down and get started on it. You're going to be a little disappointed when you get here into the store because uh, sometimes the people are coming in and shopping and you're looking for some of your summer vegetables, things that thrive in the middle of summer and the heat and the warmth like we have right now. Um, we're late in the season for that. But with the cool season stuff, which we're going to be growing towards fall and early spring, we're a little bit early for that. So we're right in this transitional place. And that's why I kind of want to talk about what's going on on sort of both of those seasons. So we'll have plenty of time for your phone calls and questions on that. And so having said all that, I think I want to get started with just a couple little um, quick explanations or definitions, I might say. Let's see, let me go back to my beginning. All right, so when I'm talking about cool season vegetables and warm season vegetables, uh, a lot of plants and particularly so we're speaking about vegetables just thrive in the heat of summer these are plants you know like tomatoes peppers beans cucumbers melons squash uh list goes on corn these are plants that we can really do quite well in our climate because they they thrive in the long warm sunny growing seasons we have so as I put in there, they uh, they're really need warm soil to grow and thrive, like when the soil temperatures are at 70, 90 degrees and plenty of sunshine. So here in our mid-Atlantic region where we are, we have this very long, warm summer um, and a long growing season for these warm season vegetables. Uh, the cool season vegetables are kind of on the flip side of this. You know, they want to be at soil temperatures around 50 to 75 degrees um, and tend to grow again in shorter days, cooler temperatures. So we have a, a real opportunity and a challenge where we're growing here in the mid-Atlantic area because what we often encounter, and of course each year is different, we'll get 
a little short season in spring uh, where we can grow some cool weather plants, things thrive. We'll get a long growing season in summer and then we'll grab a short growing season, cool season towards fall. So I say um, interesting and exciting because this allows us to grow a lot of different things. It also prevents us challenges of how we're gonna manage this. Um, and a lot of times if we're growing in small spaces and we will get kind of maximum yield, you know, how we're gonna rotate and switch between different crops, plants, and what we can realistically expect on. So that's really what I'm trying to emphasize today and going in some detail. And I'm bringing up now this time of the year so that you have a little bit of a time to think things through, a little bit of time to plan this out. So this may not be, uh, I'm gonna go out and do today kind of topic, but something that you can kind of plant that little seed in your mind, let it simmer for a little bit and figure out just how you want to best approach that. So as Sally mentioned, I'm gonna start talking about the warm season stuff and then we'll take a little break, ask for some questions and we'll start on the cool weather. So our warm season vegetables, again, tomatoes, basil, cucumbers, squash, peppers, all these things that are thriving right now. We are kind of going into sort of a peak season on them. Uh, a lot of gardeners are beginning to harvest uh, tomatoes. We really hope to get started in July. And then we really start cranking on these things as we start moving into uh, sort of August and September because they just thrive under the warm conditions that are there. Uh, and so these are all the nice juicy fruits. Technically it's a fruit uh, that we like to enjoy on the dinner table and the barbecue and the salad plate. Uh, and everything I'm talking about, it can be grown in pots and containers or it can be grown in the ground in the soil. So uh, I've shared this picture with you a lot of times because uh, I am in a small garden townhouse gardener. Uh, most of what I grow is in pots and containers. So I have a little bit of a bias that way. But also I find more and more, most of our customers are growing in pots and containers. But this really, you can do this regardless of how big or small your garden is. The biggest challenge, like I said, is that you need some sunshine that's out there. Uh, so specifically where I'm growing is I tend to use what's called an earth box planter. The only thing that's a little different about this is it has a reservoir in the bottom that holds about two, maybe three inch layer of water at the bottom. So it's a little bit of what I call self-watering device. Uh, that's always my undoing. A lot of pots and containers, when we have these 100 degree days, 90 degree days, like we just went through, you know, you're watering at least once and sometimes even twice a day just to keep them hydrated. That is beyond my ability to keep up with. So I do like these kind of self-watering pots and maybe I can get by and I only have to water maybe once every three days or every five days, depending on the temperatures and exposure. Uh, everybody's got their own recipes that they like to use for their potting mix. Where I've had some really good success, like you showed in there, is basically a combination of Maryville potting mix mixed with a bumper crop, which is a good organic compost, good soil condition. I like to use whether it's in the pots or in the ground. So for the most part, uh, most people I've been talking with this year have kind of been having what I'm gonna call mediocre results um, with growing their tomatoes. A lot of this is if you think back to um, April, it was very cold and wet. May was very cold and wet. We didn't really get into having any kind of sunshine or warmer temperatures until about June. So really uh, a lot of people tried to get an early start or do a May planting, which is traditional, kind of mother nature wasn't playing nice with us. We were just having below average temperatures, a lot of cloudy days, a lot of rainy days, and a lot of those kind of plants sort of languished and then they've really taken off and, and started growing since June. And we're starting to see some pretty good harvest come now that we're, we're getting into kind of late July and August. So it's been a little bit of a late, late season and some for some people been a little bit of a disappointing season. I should mention these pictures are all from last year. Uh, this year, just different things going on in my life uh, prevented me from getting stuff planted out there. So, so this is kind of last year's success. Again, peppers fall into this category. I have such a nightmare problem with squirrels grabbing things that I've, you know, I've kind of moved away from growing tomatoes so much um, and growing peppers. So this was just three peppers growing on, three pepper plants growing the back deck. I got about two harvests out of them, similar to what you see there on the deck railing. 
probably ended up, I think total like 17, 18 beautiful bell peppers coming out of three plants. So you can get a lot out of a little bit. Uh, but this being the virtual plant clinic, I, I do talk about some of the pest issues that are going on. And what we have seen most of this summer, I said, is things getting off to a late start. Sometimes, uh, you know, a little bit of disappointment in terms of yield and harvest just now coming in. But also, I like to say, there's entire books of tomato diseases. Uh, with the warmth, with the humidity, with the moisture, uh, these are also conditions that facilitate a lot of different pathogens uh, that are around. The one that we have seen most of is this septoria leaf spot. It tends to travel from the bottom up on the plants. You'll get little brown to black spots showing up on the leaves. Eventually they kind of coalesce together. Eventually the leaf starts to yellow like you see in the picture. Um, and then they just shed off of there. This same leaf spot can also transfer onto the fruit and then you start getting spots and sunken depressed areas showing up in the fruit. And of course, that's nothing anybody wants you know, to see on their tomatoes. So this isn't um, as serious as some pathogens. It doesn't actually kill the plant too often, but it really does diminish the yield, the quality, and leaves to spots. So it's uh, my little picture showing up there. You know, this is more warm temperatures, 68 degrees and wet conditions, which pretty much describes where we have been through most of the growing season. So what can we do uh, from our pathology classes? We know that, hey, the pathogens there, these spores are dispersed in the wind and the air. So the spores are a part of our environment. They're out there. It's one of the common diseases we see on tomatoes. But when that little spore sits on the leaf and we have warm temperatures and that leaf stays wet for an extended period of time, that's when it actually penetrates into the leaf and starts to cause these blemishes. So this has been pretty wet, widespread throughout there. So we always want to take our cultural methods first. Anything that can reduce the leaf wetness helps to reduce the opportunities to diseases. So I always emphasize like growing your plants in cages up off the ground, giving them good air circulation around there. When we water them, to water the soil to try to avoid um, getting constantly wet leaves on there. If you get yellow leaves like this, um, we can basically just snip them off of there. So just keep thinking, um, when I say dry, moist soil, but dry foliage that's on there. So this is reducing the opportunity of that pathogen to get in there. If the pathogen still gets started, because like this year, even under the best of care, so many overcast, wet, rainy days, you still encounter this problem that's when we need to start considering the use of fungicides. Again, a fungicide can't cure the disease, but it's a treatment that can protect the plant from infection that can prevent its spread from going in there. So this means something like copper or daconil or a couple examples of fungicides that are used in vegetable gardens. But keep in mind, this is not just a one-time treatment. You apply it on there, it remains effective for seven or 10 days, you end up having to apply it again remains effective for seven days. And you do this during the uh, conditions up there like 60, 80 and moist environments. Uh, copper is a natural product and it's approved for use in organic gardening. Uh, Dacanil kind of takes us over the, to the um, chemical aisle. We also are seeing a lot of mildew out there. Mildew affects just lots and lots and lots of different plants. Um, mostly we're seeing people bring it in on their they're crepe myrtles right now, but we're talking about vegetables today. So anything that we call in the cucurbit family, uh, which includes cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, um, it, they're highly susceptible to it. And mildew is a little different from some of the other diseases in that it does not actually require a wet surface. It does require high humidity. So I'm talking about humidity that runs from, you know, from like 70% to 99%. So I don't have to tell you, anybody who's been outdoors, you know, is going out there, you know, we've just been, we get trapped in these weather cycles uh, where we get in this kind of warm temperatures, again, this 75, 85 degree temperature range, humidity hovering around in the 80s, and then you start to see um, this, this powdery mildew is the one that we've run into. Uh, grows this kind of starts out, you see these whitish, 
whitish areas, eventually this leaf starts to turn brown and curl. When it's really bad, heavy pressures like this will actually get on the cucumbers themselves, for example, and or on the squash, and then the fruit itself begins to deteriorate. A different disease that's, that's completely unrelated, different life cycle, different treatments, different everything, it just has the unfortunate title of downy mildew. Um, downy mildew, you might see brown spots on the top of the leaf, but when you turn it over, you turn it upside down, that's when you kind of start to see the gray mold. This is less common. Um, it, again, it, it will grow in kind of sort of cooler to, to moderate temperatures and wet or very humid conditions, um, but it's got a totally different control strategy and less common. It's this powdery mildew that we go. Same thing that we talked about earlier. We take our, all our cultural measures of trying to keep the area, you know, let the foliage keep it as dry, keep the air circulation as good as we can, you know, grow them up on stakes or, or certainly on like a straw mulch or something, try to keep the area clean. Um, but if things get tough, if they're getting out of control, uh, you always have the option of reaching for the fungicides. Insects have not been too terribly bad. The one that I've been seeing most of uh, which is a little bit unusual, is this four-line plant bug. You rarely, rarely see the insect. What you will see is the damage that's on there. It's hard to see in these pictures. These tiny little spots that you see right here, you'll find they're like just these perfectly circular little spots showing up on the leaf like this. I tried to get, this was a customer brought in, we opened up her envelope, and we start to see that's the little nymph that we call, this immature uh, plant bug. Their mouth is like a little uh, needle, like a little syringe. They poke it into the leaf and they suck the sap out of there. And each time they poke their mouth in the leaf, um, they have a saliva that actually kind of liquefies the contents and it leaves that little circular spot. So most often what we do is we see the damage Rarely do we actually see the insect because they're always moving and scurrying around. These are what are classified as true bugs. Um, that is, bugs is a, the common name of this particular order of insects. You will see sometimes this is stink bug, closely, close relative, same family. They'll poke their mouth into the fruit, uh, again, to obtain the contents there and suck good juices out of it. But you'll see these kind of spots and blemishes show up. Uh, if you encounter these kind of things, then let me see, sorry, stop share. Uh, the insecticide that I most often recommend, uh, so there's different names on this, but this particular one I'm showing you is called Super Soap. It is an organic product, so we can use this in a vegetable garden. And it's a combination of two ingredients. This has insecticidal soap that many of you are familiar with, it also has a microbial insecticide called spinosad in here. The combination of these two takes care of a lot of pests where we're talking about cabbage worms. Um, again, plant bugs are hard to control, but it can help with that. Aphids, a whole range of different issues out there. So let's take a little break right now, see if we have any questions coming in about the warm season vegetables and what's going on right now. And then we can always switch gears and talk about the cool season vegetables is coming up soon. Okay, great. And David, um, just a quick note to everybody before we start, I'm going to start out with the warm season veggies because I know we had some other questions come in um, and then we'll we'll just start with those. If we have time, then we'll move to the others. But just a heads up, we'll always answer your questions after class if we can't get to them. Um, okay, next question. First question, not next question. I'm growing green beans using the grow box. Some of the leaves are turning brown and it doesn't look like they're being chewed by bugs. About a, a third of the leaves are turning brown. Is there a common reason for that or is there something she should do? Yeah, that's, that's something that I would really encourage you to bring a sample into the plant clinic to let us look at. Um, green beans, you know, they'll, they'll get bean beetles, which are pretty visible, um, can cause that. But what I'm concerned about is the possibility of spider mites. Spider mites are very, very common pest on green beans. Uh, they can cause what we call a stippling because, again, they're, they're tiny. They're biting the leaf, sucking the sap out of it. So you get kind of this stippled discoloration progressing to browning. Um, but we'd actually need to put that under uh, magnification to see them. They're so tiny, I can't see them just with my eyes. I have to put it under a, a hand lens or magnifier. 
we don't get a lot of diseases and the weather's not really been that tough on them. So that's why my first suspect is spider mites. But bring a clipping in if you can, just cut a couple leaves in, stop by the clinic, let's get a confirmation on that. And then we can discuss some control options for you. Okay. All right. Next two, I've got two questions that go together. Um, I, th I, th I think they probably go together pretty well. But the first one is, do you think it's too late for a second planting of cucumbers? The second one is, when is it too late to plant from seed? Yeah. So I was kind of thinking about that. One, one like, so one of the things that I love about green beans, I like I'm a big fan of bush beans. They have such a quick turnover. You know, you can go from like seed to harvest, you know, that the, the package will say like 60 days. And that's, you know, not too much of an exaggeration. So if I'm trying to rotate and get another little crop in for the summer, green beans are a great one to put in there. I think I've got really good confidence on that. Cucumbers, I think the answer is yes. Um, this, is, this is the fun part of gardening because we always have the variables of the weather. Cucumbers, again, they go from seed to harvest pretty quickly. Um, I think we're coming right up on that borderline here. So I'm not going to like promise any results, but I think the answer is yes. It really just depends how our weather goes, you know, uh, as we start moving into October. Yeah. Got it. So okay. I'm going to say, if you got the space, go for it on, like I said, green beans, a sure thing. Cucumbers, if you want to give it a shot, uh, go for it. I think, I think you'll get a harvest before uh, winter shuts us down. Oh, good to know. Okay. Um, we have two, another two questions that go together. One's on zucchini, one's on summer squash. Uh, both of these people are, are having problems with, they're not getting any flowers on their plants. Yeah. So That's, um, yeah, I'm getting a lot of um, customers coming in with that same issue. I, again, I'm putting that out really just to our, our kind of uh, quirky weather that we've had you know, things did get off to a late start, you know, because of the, um, because of the cool weather. Beyond that, I'm going to say just kind of just wait out. Hopefully you should be getting, I mean, some people are actually harvesting squash, but a lot of times it just takes a little while to get going. The others, these are plants that need full sun. A couple things that just occurred to me. One is, you know, if, the, if you're trying to grow, you know, squash, tomatoes, peppers, anything, cucumbers, if you're trying to grow these in shade, um, the lack of sunlight will stop things from growing. That may just be a factor. The other is if I'm hoping that these squash plants you have that you've actually started them from fresh seed, sometimes we'll save squash from one season to the next or squash will just volunteer from a, an old fruit left behind. And there's nothing at all wrong with that other than if this is like reversion back to some unknown or, or older variety, that could be inhibiting it. Okay, interesting. Um, all right, next question. When do you apply fungicide to tomato plants and after you apply it, when or how long do you need to wait to pick the fruit? Yeah, so, so fungicides, I, I'm going to say you know, some people actually do this preventively before they even see a problem. And that is probably really the most effective treatment. A lot of these diseases start showing as early as kind of late May, early June. So if I was going to be really vigilant and on a preventive basis, I'd probably have started at the end of May or the early part of June. Uh, like a lot of people, I mean, I just, I hate spraying anything, you know, anywhere is just not how I want to spend my time, especially not on anything that I'm growing. Uh, so if I'm going to try to reduce applications, I'm just saying, hey, check on the plants, monitor, follow all the cultural problems. If you start to see symptoms, then the sooner you can step in, then the better your success will be. Regarding from when I spray it, when I can harvest it, that depends really on the specific product that we're talking about. On the labels, when you look at these different fungicide products, you know, if you peel this open and you look at the details in the backside, there's what's we're often the least little acronyms is called PHI, a post-harvest interval. It will tell you specifically the number of days between application and harvest. So most of your natural products, and again, I'm generalizing here, but let's say if I'm using copper, and this is what, what most homeowners use copper because it is a natural product. 
Um, this one, I think, can be used up to the day of harvest, where I could spray it today, harvest the fruit tomorrow, as long as I clean it thoroughly, as opposed to some of the chemical treatments like Dacanil. Again, double check me, always read the label and follow. I think this has about five day, what you call PHI, post harvest interval. It will be specified on the label and make sure you always look at that and follow it. What I found is in big general terms, the natural products like copper help, but they're just not as good. They're not as effective as some of the chemical treatments that go. So you kind of make personal choices in there, depending on what your circumstances are, find out what works best for you. But, but good question. And that information is on the label. Okay. All right. Next question, harvesting question. Um, I just picked some tomatoes that are large but green. How do I ripen them at my home? I've heard paper bags and keep them in a basement away from light. Um, and that's certainly true. You can do that. Uh, I can also tell you if, if you're kind of just lazy or casual about it, just put them on the kitchen counter and they'll ripen up on their own. The whole idea is when a, when a fruit is ripening, when those, those cells are aging, they start to release um, a gas, a volatile gas called ethylene. So the paper bag idea is if I put my tomato in a paper bag, it, it ventilates so that you don't have the tomato rot, but it also, that ethylene gas is kind of trapped inside the paper bag and that can hasten or speed up the ripening. So if you had like a storm that knocked the green tomatoes off, um, just use them as green tomatoes is always a great option if you're into that. Um, they will ripen on just the kitchen counter, put them in a bag, that's fine. A vine ripe tomato, of course, if it gets to sit on the vine up to the day of harvest, uh, it just develops more sugars in it. It's going to have better, more aromatic, a little more flavorful, um, but they still taste pretty dang good if you let them ripen on the kitchen shelf. Yeah, I used to kind of play chicken with the squirrels. I'd grab them like a day early before the squirrels would try and go for them. I was always like trying to, how long? That, I played that game for years, exactly. The squirrels always beat me. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I missed a few times, but yeah, I was always trying to figure out like, okay, if I grab it a day early or two days early. Um, all right, anyways, next question is another harvesting question. Um, I think I'm harvesting my green beans wrong. Where do I cut the, cut the green beans off? Uh, so, so let me just say a little thing about green beans. Um, so bush beans, which is what I like to grow. Um, let me even back up a step. So, so, so beans are a vine, right? And they would naturally be trailing, growing up on some type of support. And if you're growing, so that's referred to as a pole bean because it's a vine that's growing up the bean on there. Pole beans, I love the flavor in them. And they will produce continuously a little bit at a time all through the summer. For the sake of convenience and space, I really mostly would be growing bush beans. It's technically is a vine, but it's so dense and so compact, it stays small, doesn't require a big support. Pole beans, the harvest comes in, I mean, or the, the bush beans, usually the harvest comes quicker and more at once, so they might come in and give you a really good harvest, pick, 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 get one good harvest out of it. A couple of weeks later, you know, maybe you get a second pick on by the third pick, they're pretty much done for the year, you know, and you just pull them up. Um, so, so don't expect to be picking from them continuously. As far as where you actually remove them, the uh, best way I can say this is they kind of grow in a cluster like this, where you'll have several beans hanging off of there. Um, and I just go in with my fingernail or something. I just literally cut them off right at the top of the bean, or you could probably do that with scissors if you if you don't like that. And I'll say this, this where, zoom, this where I need to use my whiteboard and I could draw you a picture. But you'll see the, the bean hangs down. Um, there's a little stem and then the bean hangs there. You actually want to sort of cut it or snap it at the stem, but you just pick them individually when they're still tender before the seeds get really large, you know, as the seeds start to get too big, the bean starts to be less flavorful, not as juicy. Okay. All right. It looks like we have one more question related specifically to the warm season vegetables um, for the moment. So the, the question is, how do you harvest and store seeds from plants you've harvested this season? Yeah. So for, for example, since we're talking about beans, if you wanted to salvage uh, bean seeds, 
instead of picking that bean, you would just let it go through the summer, it would reach full maturity, and you'll literally see that bean capsule starts to turn brown. And if you leave it on there long enough, that capsule will split and the beans fall out. So you basically leave it on there until it reaches full maturity. Uh, and then before it actually opens and drops the seed, that's when you would want to harvest it. One of the things is, um, I'm gonna say this on seed saving, is those, if you're harvesting seed, you have to let that vegetable reach its full maturity. That might be beyond its perfect harvest date. So if I wanna pick beans when they're still fleshy and juicy and succulent, if I wanna get seed from there, I have to let go of that and let it go all the way to full maturity. Same as if you're saving tomato, you know, tomato seeds or something, like if somebody said, hey, I got a green tomato, the seeds in there have not matured. They're not gonna be viable. So. Uh, you leave some of the vegetables on there, which whatever you're growing, let reach full maturity. When they are, take them, I say, hey, clean them out, get any debris, any dust, any dirt that's out there. Not, I don't want to actually get them wet. I want to get them dry. So I'll take the seeds, um, maybe even lay them out, um, not in a sunny spot, but a shady protected environment or even a kitchen counter with good air circulation lay them out, this could be on paper towel or something, depending on the size, let them air dry. And once you have where those are clean and they're dry, they can be packed away. I just like to put them in Ziploc bags and I'll put that in a Tupperware container or something, put it into a cool, dark spot. Ideally, uh, we want them stored at about like that 50 to 60 degree temperature range in a dark area and keep them dry. Um, most of these seeds, depending on what we're talking about, most of them are stayed pretty good and viable for at least three years. We can only sell seed this one year old. That's a law, that's just state law. So we constantly have to bring fresh seed in. But if you're doing saving at home, I've had really good luck on most of these things lasting at least three years. After three years, I think it's, it's not an absolute thing, but it's probably time to get some new seeds. Okay. All right. We, that covers all of our questions for now that aren't related to cool season or other topics. So um, I think now- Let's go back to my pictures then here. Because this is really what I wanted to talk about most of all today. So again, this was last year. Um, and, and again, I, I feel, as soon as I have to tell you, I have to, to reuse slides. Uh, Again, so these are cool season vegetables. These are plants, again, that are going to flourish when temperatures are in that kind of 50 to 75 degrees. So when I say 50 to 75 degrees, I'm really talking about, you know, October, November, um, even well into the December time period. So we're definitely looking ahead, but we can't wait until then to make our decisions because it's going to take time for these plants to grow and mature. Uh, so again, this was like these same earth boxes that I was growing tomatoes and peppers in. Uh, it reaches a point, some point in time where you say, hey, okay, it's time for me to do the old switcheroo um, and, and move over into cool season. So this is uh, broccoli back here, cabbage up here, Brussels sprouts behind them. Uh, these plants, um, take a fair amount of time to mature and develop, which is part of what I emphasize is planting on here. So when I put in here, this was sort of my first harvest um, and they're not fully mature, but I wanted to put some of my vegetables out on the table uh, for Thanksgiving. That's why that November date is no coincidence. These pl plants, these transplants actually went in the first part of September to give them a little bit of time to get established, get growing. I had my sort of first initial harvest, not quite fully there on 26. Brussels sprouts are ridiculously cold hardy. Um, and I did my final harvest there in March, the following spring. So the cool season vegetables, there's many of them that you can grow. You can get a long season of, of harvest out of them. They're, they're sometimes in my book require a little more attention, um, but the rewards are well worth it. So when I'm talking about things like um, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, broccoli, uh, cauliflower, these are all we call the cruciferi family or the mustard family or cabbage family, all kind of in the same group. Uh, what I'm trying to emphasize, it is too early to plant them now. If you put them out now in the summer heat, 
what's going to happen is under the high temperatures, these things, they, they want to revert to what I call their flowering phase. We, we're trying to keep them in the vegetative phase because we're not so much eating the flowers. Now, broccoli, this is a flower bud that we're eating, but we're trying to keep them vegetative so I can enjoy the, the sprouts, the foliage, the leaves uh, before they reach full maturity. Again, broccoli is a little exception. Broccoli, cauliflower, we're eating flower buds. If these are out under high temperatures, the plant responds by wanting to go flower and produce seed. So that's where I'm saying this temperature thing um, becomes a little bit tricky. So these plants, um, probably we're gonna start with transplants, well, which I mentioned, but I'm looking at this might be more of a uh, late August through September time period to get started on it. Uh, the, the thing that I did, basically two things that we need to do to be successful with them. Um, one is, like I said, the timing on the planting. Uh, you'll probably need to get them in the ground, ideally by late August, um, early September time period, depending on weather, maybe, maybe even early August. Uh, but we need to protect them from the really hot temperatures. And they are always, they are always plagued by this cabbage worm. This is the adult butterfly. You'll see it flying around and he's like, oh, I'm so glad to see a butterfly, but this is actually an imported cabbage worm, what they call uh, the larvae, the little caterpillar is perfectly disguised. You can't really see them, but I would go out basically and inspect the vegetables almost daily. And what I'm doing is you learn to recognize their feces, their little poop. It's like these little green balls that are in there. It's like when I see that, it's like, dang, I got the cabbage worms in there and they will just go in there and devour any of these um, plants for you. So this comes back again to what I was talking about earlier with my super soap. So I was really vigilant on keeping the super soap out of it. And with these two things of kind of managing the, the temperatures on it, you know, good success in that department and being really vigilant about these cabbage worms had pretty good results. So with the timing of, we're going to start plants either from seeds or transplants. Anything that develops like a head on, like a head cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, they need a cool season to get established. Let like the commercial growers have a controlled environment, let them do that. They will develop the transplants. And what you're doing is you're coming in to purchase little small plants for us. They'll probably be here. It, it might be, it could happen really, I think anytime in the month of August. We're just watching the weather when they're available and we'll bring them in when conditions are good for us. So that's something you might want to leave some space in your garden or think about allowing room for it as we move into the season. There are things that we can grow from seed quite successfully. These are more the greens. So I'm thinking about, um, you know, lettuce, kale, Swiss chard, you know, of these kinds of things. They can grow pretty well from seed. Uh, again, I'm thinking this gets to a little bit about when I'm gonna actually start. These I put in as transplants. You can see they're individual baby plants we put in and let them grow. This I put in just from seed, just scattering the seed and letting it grow up there. Part of what I want to say is that, uh, let me stop my sh share. So I'm going to actually be growing some greens. I'm going to get started on this next week. But what I'm doing is I, I didn't get my summer stuff planted because I just was out of town, had other things going on. Uh, I'm not growing up on my deck because I just had that all refurbished, repainted, cleaned up, and restored. But it occurs to me, my, my, right now today, my little earth boxes, they're sitting down underneath the deck, um, waiting for me to, to do something with them. So my idea is I'm going to probably go ahead and plant some uh, Swiss chard now. This is early to get started, but I believe that I have what I'm calling this microclimate by putting it at the ed, underneath my deck, a little bit of an edge environment, keeping the direct sun off of it, but still bright, uh, indirect light, I think it's gonna work for me. And this is the whole fun of gardening, the experimenting and stuff. So if you wanna play around and you wanna try to grow some greens, the greens, they're not really going for the flower, the fruit. They don't require as much sunlight. And if you have an area where you can keep some of the heat of it off 
and the weather cooperates for us, you, you might get started as early now with seeds, or you might want to say, I'm going to play it safe and wait another two weeks, four weeks, or something like that. But there are some things that we can get started on now. The other stuff, the majority of it, I'm going to tell you, hang in there, um, wait maybe another three or four weeks, and then we'll be really into prime time on that. That's why I had to say I only got a few minutes left, so let's see if we've got questions. All right. Yes, we do have questions. Um, the first one is, can we start? You may have addressed this. I just want to make sure I'm not missing something since I don't know a ton about starting fruit seeds. Um, can we start cool season vegetables using the winter sowing process? It's going to be hard to do because right now, well, I don't know what weather is, you know, like it's, uh, you know, just in the past, right? We were just out in the sweltering heat, but let's pretend it's uh, something like 87 degrees out there right now. Um, and if you do winter sowing, that's going to be really hot inside that thing. So what we need is actually to get these plants going, we need cool temperatures. So I don't, I've never tried it, but I don't see this as a good candidate for winter sowing. Okay. Um, next question. I planted my cauliflower and broccoli too late in the spring and they never flowered. Now they are tall and leafy. Will they flower when the temperature cools or should I just tear them up and plant new ones in the fall? I think you'd have better success just tearing up and planting for fall. Uh, yeah, I, I shouldn't say exactly when they got planted. I'll say we kind of had a long, cool spring. I find these things do better as a fall crop than they do as spring. I've, I've been successful in growing in spring. We kind of had an extended spring. This was a good year to try. Um, but it's, it's the, the quality of the broccoli and stuff is just not going to be as tender and everything. I would say when we get the plants in, which might still be a few weeks from now, you might go ahead and just call it quits, pull them up and try again. Would, that's what I would be doing. Okay. Um, next question. This is my first time growing dill plants from seed and they're doing almost nothing. I grow them with basil and rosemary, which are doing fine. Do you have any suggestions? Um, not really. I hate it when people say this to me. Dill is like one of the easiest things to grow from seed. They, um, you know, I just let self sow. I grow for the butterflies more than anything. Um, dill does prefer a little bit cooler temperatures, so it might have had something to do with the time. Right now, they are full flower and the seed is maturing. Uh, don't know how well it would do as a fall crop, but if you want to try seeding some now, you might put it. But again, I just direct sow it into the garden. Um, and it, it just keeps coming back on itself. So anyway, kind of a, a long-winded answer here, but uh, there's really no tricks to it. Maybe maybe it's old seed or outdated seed or something, but um, I wouldn't hesitate to try again. And if you even want to start some now at this time of year, uh, it may not reach full maturity, it may not reach flowering, but you would have the, you could eat the leaves. Okay. Um, all right, next question. Are carrots a cool season vegetable? Uh, carrots are definitely a cool season vegetable. They are not the easiest thing to grow. Uh, I've you you can do it if you love carrots and do it for the fun, do it for the experience. But that's one of the things I found I can I can let the uh, you know do much better at the grocers or the farm market on that. Around here with our our weather, when it gets hot like this in the summertime, they get dry, they get pithy, they're just not as good the carrots, and they never quite get as mature and juicy as people maybe live in a little bit more northern climates. If you wanted to grow carrots as a fall crop, um, I think you could start seeding. This is probably the very earliest that I would seed. You might even wait, but sometime during, you know, maybe the end of August, early September, but you could try growing as a fall crop, but they're never going to do quite as well as what you see at the grocers. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, Okay, the next question kind of direct, goes directly into what you were just discussing. If you're direct sowing your fall seed crop, this person specifically asking about greens, um, when would you direct sow those into the ground? Uh, as I mentioned, because this is the side you want to say microclimate, everybody, you know, you find these little niches in your garden, you find spots, it depends on the details of exactly where you are. I'm actually going to probably start next week. This is just, I'm ready to do it now. It's just me having the time and the energy to go do it. I'm going to start next week 
um, in a partially shaded indirect light kind of environment, hoping that that's going to be enough to keep the hot weather off of it. If I was in a full sun environment, I would definitely hold off for like another four weeks, maybe even up to six weeks. Okay. So we're, just, we're, we're right in that kind of range where you could, this is like the very earliest. I would start. Okay. Sound, sounds good. So maybe depending on your environment between now and the next few weeks. Right. Okay. Um, I had great luck using milk containers for seed starting. Will this work for fall planting? Oh yeah, absolutely. They, they will do fine. What I was talking about a little bit with that um, winter sowing, uh, winter sowing idea is that we're actually using the milk jugs to keep the seeds warm. So that's where we're using like a, a milk jug that's enclosed like a little greenhouse. That's not gonna work so well for you at this time of year. That's what we're talking about. But if you're talking about just like cutting the top off and using it as a pot, that I would be okay with. But now I'm realizing if you're thinking like that little mini greenhouse thing, I think it's going to get too hot in there. Okay. All right. It is 2.46. I just realized. Um, so for those questions that we didn't get to, uh, please, please, please feel free to go. Hit reply on that a uh, confirmation email that helps you log into the Zoom class. Send those questions to us. I see one asking about a plant ID. You can send that uh, to us as well. If you have plant clinic questions, send those. I will give all of them to David. I do not answer them myself. David will answer them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so we'll take care of you guys. Um, David, actually, I'm going to go ahead and ask you this. So before you wrap up, uh, we just had someone ask if you're going to leave the cool weather vegetables under the deck for the entire duration that you're growing them, or are you going to move them out in the sun? Uh, to be determined. Yes. All right. We'll let you know. We'll keep you updated. Yeah. Um, no, our they'll probably just kind of stay out maybe at the, the perimeter of the deck. They I just don't have a, a nice sunny spot, but it, yeah, as it got cooler and if I had some more sun, I might bring them out into the sun. Pull them out. That's the good thing about the containers. All righty. Um, yeah. So definitely please feel free to follow up with if any questions that didn't get answered or if anything comes up. Uh, we have a recording. You can send me a request for that, or it will be up on YouTube tomorrow on our YouTube channel. They generally go up about 24 hours after the class. Um, so that will be available. Uh, and I think that's everything from me. So I believe we'll see you all again in two weeks. And David, do you want to wrap up with anything or do you know your next topic already or? No, I haven't figured that out. We kind of go along, but I, again, please uh, keep, keep coming back to visit, enjoy doing these things. One last little thing I just thought of, um, because like when we talk about carrots and all, Thing is, our, we have a short growing season. So like a lot of root crops, for them to really fully develop, they need a longer growing season that we're able to provide sometimes. Uh, again, garlic, I didn't mention, but like garlic's a great one to plant in the fall because that's a, a root crop. But again, it's winter hardy, so it will go through winter and you can do it next, um, next summer and everything. So again, we've got a lot of things to play with, but we manipulate it and there's different ways to manipulate the plant and experiment and have fun with it. So anyway, I've taken up more of your time than I deserve. Uh, thanks for joining us. Always good information, David. I know I learn a lot. Um, all righty. Thank you, everybody. And have a great afternoon. And we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Bye, David. Bye-bye.